The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, uh, let's uh, have a recap of our last lecture. So uh, what we were doing is uh, use the Boltzmann e uh, equation uh, under relaxation time approximation. So that's a relaxation time. And uh, uh, under this approximation, we can write uh, and also uh, linearize. So we keep the first order of the left-hand side of the Boltzmann equation and replace that f by f0. That's uh, essentially, so the distortion due to the transport. And the f0 is the equilibrium. So if f is just equal f0, there's no transport. And uh, but say when we have a gradient in f0 and in both uh, uh, real space and velocity or f uh, momentum uh, uh, space, we have the deviation from the equilibrium. Right, uh, so this is the uh, uh, first order solution for the Boltzmann equation under relaxation time approximation. And using this, we say from here you can look at the heat flux, the momentum flux, and the charge flux. So you can do all the flux uh, and get the considerable relations. We derive the Fourier law. And in this case, so we took a full line as example. F0 is the distribution function. But in this case, the temperature becomes space dependent. So t is a function of x. And that we do not have the momentum dependence. So we took this out. And uh, you get the F0, uh, F solution. And then from there, you calculate the heat flux. And the flux is always whatever flux we had is uh, uh, F itself times the velocity in that direction, right? And let's say here. And, uh, 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 and then you sum up of all the states and per unit area, so normalize per volume, right? So this is the flux itself. And of course, if you want to calculate momentum, you put the momentum per quantum state, or if you calculate the heat, that's the heat carried, energy carried per quantum state. And uh, next, what we plan to do is to calculate the charge flux, the current. So we're doing electrons. And uh, 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 just uh, say, we're, I was commenting Fourier law, so for Fulon, is T is the function of x. And then when we did the Newton shear stress law, we say F0 is, uh, we replace with the displaced uh, Boltzmann, uh, this Maxwell distribution, right? Because the molecule has a long zero average velocity U. This is the average velocity V is the uh, phase space velocity. The uh, uh, V itself covers from mass infinite to plus infinite. But uh, the U is a function of the space only. That's the average over all the momentum space, right? So uh, this case, u is a function of uh, uh, r. So that's where uh, we took a derivative. We again look at the momentum flux. We got the Newton shear stress law. And uh, I might just comment, for example, if you want, look at this. If t is a function of x, you have both momentum transport and also, say, the spatial dependent due to temperature, right? Temperature could also drive the uh, um, mass flow. And this is, in fact, a couple of heat and mass transfer. And uh, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't go into those details. And uh, if you want to derive, I think one of the homework is actually doing the uh, thermal, con derive thermal conductivity for gas molecules. And in that case, you actually have to do, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, say, a mass balance and heat balance. 
and uh, this will you will see uh, the more clearly in the example we're trading, and that's actually for the coupled uh, charge and the heat transfer when we deal with the electrons. So uh, at the end of last lecture, we uh, discussed the electron transport, and we finally show that the solution when applied to electron is uh, the F0, and then this gradient terms, the complication for electrons is that we not only have spatial gradient due to uh, uh, the Fermi Dirac distribution here, but also we have the force applied to electron. And because we want to have an electrostatic field, the field will act a force, right, under uh, electrostatic field. So we combine all those and we derive at the end we have three terms df dx, ef is the chemical potential, and dc dx, which is the electrostatic potential. This is a uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, I'll come, come on the word the reference, and dt dx, where I have temperature gradient. Right? So I have those three terms, and the df dek, ek is the kinetic energy. So this is where we spend, uh, uh, made, I made some comments. So you have to understand that what's the chemical potential, what's the electrostatic potential, and what's the electrochemical potential. Right, so uh, uh, we said the difference between EC and uh, the uh, Fermi level, right, is the electrochemical potential. So is uh, here is if uh, this mu is relative to whatever absolute uh, reference, a flat reference, and this mu is made of the electrochemical potential, which determines how many particles I have. So how many particles I have in the conduction band. If you look at this, is Ek. So this is the kinetic energy relative to the bottom of the conduction band. That's Ek. Minus Ef. So this EF relative EC is negative, so that's the difference there. EK minus EF, right? So this itself determine the number of particles in the conduction band. So that's consistent with the chemical potential determined is related to number of particles, right? And uh, EC relative to the Absolute level is where the potential energy of the electron, the bottom of the electron, that's where the potential energy is. So mu, which is a combination of EF plus EC relative to absolute, is the electrochemical potential. It's combined the chemical potential with the electric potential. So when I look at the driving force, in fact, you can say EF and the, D, the two gradient electrostatic potential gradient and chemical potential gradient are equivalent positions. They can both drive the charge flow. And then we have a temperature gradient. So with this, you can move the, to the rest. For example, I want to calculate the charge flux. I'm doing Q, right? For electron, Q is negative E. For holes, Q is positive E. So I'm just going to use Q. And uh, if I want to look at the x direction, so I have Vx, I have Q, and I have F. I have, say, 2, factor of 2 to count for the spin. And I sum of Kx, Ky, Kz. Right? So you can say, if I replace Q by mass per charge, I guess the mass flux, it doesn't matter when I deal with the electron flow, but it matters when I deal with the mass diffusion. Right? So all those uh, uh, is under the same idea. The real difference is what's the quantity we're interested in and what's the uh, detail of the F itself. And uh, starting from here, your tax is the same as we did for the uh, Fourier law, for Lewis shear stress law. You're going to convert 
this summation into integration. You choose your own coordinate, whether you want to work with uh, energy, you want to work with momentum. If you recall, for Fourier law, we work with the frequency. For Newton shear stress law, we actually worked with Vx, Vy, Vz. And here, uh, you can, the best is still work with the energy Ek in this case, because the F itself depends on F0. F0 has Ek inside. And that would be the easiest way to, to deal with. So I'm not going to go through the intermediate step. And I'm going to give you the final result. What I have is a, a couple of term, L11 minus 1 over Q DEF DX plus DEC DX plus L12 minus DT DX. So the current flow is coupled to electrochemical potential gradient and temperature gradient. EF plus EC again is D mu. So here is D mu DX minus Q. And sometimes it's also written as the Q mu over Q. Let's use a capital Phi DX. And uh, uh, see, this is called the EMF, electromotive force. Okay, it's a combination of uh, electrostatic and uh, uh, chemical potential uh, grid. Uh, say, uh, for, uh, say. So here, because uh, remember, these are the energy units. When I talk about electrostatic potential, I do actually EC divided by Q, normalized by charge. So there are different units, and the, even they all call it potential. Some is the energy unit, and uh, the other is the energy divided by Coulomb, right? So I have those coefficient, the coupled transport, L11, L12. Let me give you, uh, say, uh, expression for L11, L12. And the L11, after you do all your math integration, you say it's uh, one third uh, Q square, zero to infinite, and the V square tau, and the D E K, and D F zero, D E K, and D E K. And if I do have a parabolic band, remember the energy E K is one half M V square over 2, right? Or if I do the, uh, uh, say, in quantum term, is, uh, say, 2m h bar square k, because uh, mv is uh, the momentum h bar k. So uh, you can uh, convert this v into ek and do your integration. Uh, OK? So this is uh, the uh, one coefficient, and the other coefficient, L12 is uh, mass Q divided by 3t, 0 to infinite, V squared tau, and Ek mass Ef, Df0, Dek, Dek. So uh, if I know the density of states, oh, I should have density of states density of states, D, uh, E, K. OK, so if you know the density of states, you know relaxation time, you can calculate those transport coefficients. Right? And uh, 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 if you recall, when we talk about uh, the electron energy levels, chronic panning model, those are the different ways to calculate the details of the band structure of different materials. And from that, you can get density of states. And from density of states, you dope the material. So based on doping, you can determine where is your EF. EF can be adjusted by doping. Okay? 
And uh, this is harder to calculate how relaxation time. We discussed, uh, 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 in fact, uh, say there are really not good way, not many calculation of the relaxation time for electrons. And because, uh, say, once you go to those scattering process, it's always a higher order and the more difficult to deal with. But say, in general, the framework is there. Like uh, you do density function theory, you can calculate the uh, band structure of uh, different materials and calculate then substates, EF, all those uh, other quantity. And uh, uh, from there, you can potentially also calculate the scattering rate using the perturbation method, like Fermi Golden Rule. OK, so those are the, uh, uh, the functional form we have. And uh, uh, let's look a little more into details what the uh, solution tells us. OK, so first uh, let's look at the constant temperature case. There's no temperature gradient. And uh, in the case of constant temperature, let's drop the first term, uh, the second term here, right? Then the uh, current flux is related to electrochemical potential gradient. I further or distinguish it, uh, say, metal. And in metal, the electron density is very high. So effectively, there's no change in the electron density. And uh, if you recall, the difference, uh, say, between metal and semiconductor, when we discussed before, this is the electron energy, momentum. Let's say here is the, uh, uh, say, uh, electron uh, band structure, the uh, energy V vector relation. In case of metal, my Fermi level is deep into the band, right? This is my EF. And uh, the most of this charge below the Fermi level, they don't have, it's because they are not mobile. They, they are field states, so only about the KT near the Fermi level are the charge that actually moves. Right, so in this case, uh, if I look at the, the, the term uh, EF, which is the chemical potential, the charge, uh, number density of the charge in the metal doesn't change much, so DEF, DX can be dropped out. It's really electrostatic potential pretty much that uh, 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 is driving uh, the uh, charge flow. And if I look at the transport, essentially, this is Ohm's law, right? JQ, the current flux, is proportional to the electrochemical, uh, the potential gradient, and the L11 is the electric conductivity. So I have L11 is the electric conductivity. And uh, in the case of metal, right, this differentiation is non-zero near the Fermi level. And the other places, they are all pretty much zero. So I can approximate this uh, integral with one third tau f. This is the relaxation time at the Fermi level. And density of states at the Fermi level, e squared vf velocity at the Fermi level. So this is the uh, electric conductivity, and uh, which you can further read in, uh, because uh, say you can relate density of states to the electron number density in the material. So this is the N e squared, uh, say m tau f. Okay. So that's the uh, electric conductivity. Uh, in metal, it's mainly uh, the Carrier density doesn't change much. It's the electrostatic potential uh, that's driving uh, the current flow. Now, if we look at the semiconductor, and 
And in semiconductor, I have both the carrier density and the electrochemical uh, the uh, electrostatic potential gradient. They all could vary in the semiconductor when you make a pin junction. For example, there is a large change in the band edge of the semiconductor. So uh, both term uh, uh, is uh, say changing, and uh, the current density is often written as rather than writing into just this term, you actually uh, sometimes split this out. One is related to density E of dx, that's related to carrier density. This one is related to electrostatic potential. So the, uh, in semiconductor, uh, the uh, famous equation people saw is Q and mu epsilon x. That's the electric field, okay, which is the gradient of negative, just a, a say one over Q dec dx. Okay, and plus a diffusion term dn dx, because def, ef determine the carrier density. There is a fixed relation between ef and n. So def dx is dn dx and with the uh, uh, diffusion coefficient a. So here is diffusivity. And here, is uh, uh, the, the reason it's written in metal, we don't talk about the mu, we talk about sigma. In semiconductor, this n changes a lot. So you normalize the sigma, this q and mu gives you sigma, electric conductivity, right? So here is sigma, and this mu is the mobility. Okay, so uh, sigma equals Q and mu. And if you go back to here, because sigma is N E square M tau F, right? So in general, mu is related to uh, M um, uh, N tau. So uh, no, no N, uh, E tau. Say uh, E tau, say, the, yeah, divided by m, right? So measuring the mobility, effectively, you see in this, you have the effective mass, you have the relaxation time. So it's a measure of the relaxation time and or give you information about the effective mass, okay? And uh, uh, now you can say, in fact, both of those terms, right, have the same coefficient. I'm just writing, splitting them up. So this uh, diffusivity and the mobility are related to each other. And the relation between diffusivity and the mobility, A is uh, Kb T over E times mu. And this is uh, called the Einstein relation. Okay, it's a general relation, I say, between the mobility and diffusivity. Einstein didn't work on this, okay? What he really worked on is the Brownian motion. And in the case of Brownian motion, the uh, particle diffusivity, you think about the milk molecules in uh, water, right? The milk molecule, Diffusivity is related to viscosity of the fluids. So this is a general, in fact, I say their generalization of this, as I said before, Einstein started this other direction, linear response theory, and this is a part of, uh, uh, say, uh, dissipation, fluctuation dissipation theory. General, very general 
So this is a diffusion is a, a fluctuation process. Mobility is a dissipation collision process. So that's a fluctuation dissipation theorem. That's a one example of fluctuation dissipation theorem. Uh, Einstein relation between the mass diffusion and the viscosity is another example. So there are many examples of fluctuation dissipation, very general. So what the electrical engineer do is solving this equation. Here is called drift diffusion. So this is the drift diffusion equation. Okay, so if you look at a lot of things, in fact, uh, uh, even nowadays, right, the CMOS, say, uh, say, uh, uh, say MOS, right, you all know is a metal oxide fail effect transistors, right? And even with the gate now shrank to uh, tens, I don't know exactly how many tens, 20 or 30 nanometers the industry is still using this equation, okay? And they just uh, tweak the parameters. They tweak the mobility parameter, diffusivity parameters, just to fit the device characteristics. And they know it's not quite valid because the electron mean free pass could be larger, but uh, it's built in many softwares. It's amazing that uh, they can still use it to design the circuits. Okay, so that's the uh, semiconductor drift diffusion equation. If you design solar cell, this will be the equation you're going to solve. Most solar cells. Okay, and uh, so now let's look at uh, the uh, first case we discussed is a constant temperature, and uh, uh, let's discuss when temperature is not constant. Right, it's a, a function of x. So in this case, I have a material. I have a temperature gradient, right? And uh, in the x direction, I have heat conduction. And what happens? Say first, uh, if I open circuit. Je equals zero. So what do you have if you have open circuit J? Oh, not E Q. I now E is for electron. Q is more general. Sometimes I switch because there are not enough symbols. Okay. And when you deal with the heat, you like to use a Q. And when you deal with the charge, you like to use E, but the E is negative. So all this complication. But open circuit, right? If you look at my uh, flux equation here, and what I have is this is zero, but I have two terms on the right hand side. dt dx is not zero, so I will have d phi dx non zero that balance it. So what I really have in this case, I have my C back coefficient is defined as the negative d phi dx. This is uh, uh, essentially uh, the, uh, sometimes we use the uh, say electric field, the epsilon x, right? But say uh, I used the epsilon x before, so I'm just going to d phi dx and dt dx. Okay? And this one is the C by coefficient. And then equals L12, L11. And remember L11 is sigma. So if I look at this, I substitute the expression for those coefficients. Right? If you say the difference of the two, v squared tau, v squared tau, d and d, df0, dek, the difference is just ek minus ef. And of course, in the front, there's small difference. Right? So what I have here is I will have E over tau, uh, E T, T is the temperature, e is the positive charge, uh, um, now sign problem, V squared tau, 
and the ek minus ef df0 dek and density of states ek dek I write it because I want to explain what it means right v square tau df0 dek 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 So you can say that this is the Seebeck effect. Seebeck coefficient. And the uh, Seebeck effect was discovered in 1821. That was uh, about the same time electricity was studied. And uh, uh, so basically, when you apply a temperature gradient to material, you generate uh, uh, electrochemical potential gradient. OK? And what happens now, if you look at this, is a temperature gradient drive a diffusion right? current. So when I uh, have higher temperature, the electrons diffuse faster, they come to this side. There are more on this side. When there are more, the chemical potential will change, the electrostatic potential will change, they are readjusted to resist the diffusion. So this term is resist diffusion, this is diffusion, right, driving force. So at the end, you have a, a lead, open circuit, lead charge equals zero. Right, the current current flow equals zero, and you have a voltage developed across the material. Okay, and so that's the uh, phenomenological explanation. Now, if I connect this to the band structure, so here is my conduction band. Now, just look at the conduction band. Right here is where the chemical potential level, Fermi level is. And uh, Ek minus Ef, so is this difference, right? I said this is e say, this is Ef itself, right? Ek is uh, here, so I have Ek minus Ef. So it's the average energy. You can see here, this is Ek minus Ef. Is so the rest is just the here. You can think about that each electron at a certain energy level has a specific energy dependent spectral contribution to electric conductivity. And I'm averaging that to the differential electric conductivity there. Right? So C by coefficient is the average of the electron energy relative to the chemical potential. Okay? And uh, this also, the electron energy right to chemical potential is the heat. So it's the average energy per charge. And uh, you use thermocouple. So next time you can say you're measuring a voltage reading out of thermocouple, fundamentally is, the average, is actually the heat per charge carried you measure. And heat per charge carried is also the entropy per charge carried. So the Seebeck coefficient is really uh, entropy uh, of the charge. OK? And uh, with that, you can also appreciate why metal has a low Seebeck coefficient. So if I look at, uh, say, metal, I draw the Fermi level of metal here, right? and uh, is the if the electron is above the Fermi level, they have positive heat. If electron below the Fermi level, they have negative heat. But in metal, you are averaging overall positive and negative, they cancel each other. Right? So that's why metal has a low C by coefficient. And uh, in a semiconductor, my hole is here. My EF is very close to 
uh, uh, the chemical potential uh, to the conduction band or very close to the valence band. So normally, I want the one type of carrier, and do, they do not cancel each other. But in fact, uh, in, in most uh, 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 thermoelectric effect, uh, you actually dope it very heavily into the band. Okay. So your chemical will then get into the very close to the bottom conduction band, but, but above it. And in that case, those carriers in the bottom, below that chemical potential, is actually harmful. They, they do cancel, right? So uh, that's why in some of those structures, people want, rather than this kind of parabolic density of states, but if you have those kind of density of states, sharp features, it will be better. OK? That's the quantum size effects, and we'll, uh, we can go, we'll discuss more size effects in the next chapter. So this is the Seebach uh, uh, effect, and that's the, so associated with the charge flow, I have also uh, the heat uh, carried by, uh, the, due to the uh, drive the charge flow. And now let's look at the other, which is the heat carried, right? Heat flow. Okay. And uh, what is the heat flow? I already mentioned that uh, the e ma EK mass EF is the heat carried. And in fact, uh, uh, you could write down the energy equals. Right, the first law tells us the energy equals the heat plus uh, EF dN, right? The chemical potential times the change in the number of particles. That's the first law. You can also add the electrostatic. So basically, the energy in the material is uh, say n times the uh, energy per charge, right? That's uh, my E or here. So you can say dQ per charge is uh, E minus EF. So it's really the heat is here, EK minus EF is my heat. So is heat carried per, uh, 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 say, uh, quantum state? So with that, I can go to calculate what's the total amount of heat when the current flows in the material. So J, Q, I think my book uses one is J, E, the other is J, small Q, but since I've been keeping J, Q as for the charge, so now I'm doing the capital Q. Okay, so J, K, O then is two over V, K, X, K, Y, Kz, right? And if you look at it here, when we do the charge per quantum state, is Q, right? And uh, here, what I have is uh, the heat is Ek minus Ef and Vxf. So again, I'm applying my general expression, general way how to find the, what's the uh, flux uh, for different quantities. And uh, you go through the conversion of the summation into integration again. And what you find out is I have uh, L21 minus uh, D phi, again, D phi dx, because I already have F, right? And uh, plus L22 minus DT dx. So this is the current flux. So I have a set of coupled expression. J for the electrical is L11 d phi dx, and L12 dt dx. And uh, for the heat flow, I have 21 L22 uh, dt dx. Right. And in fact, there is a very fundamental relation between those coefficients. Anytime you see coupled, coupled expressions, Right, say the uh, charge is coupled to temperature, that's a cross term, right? If you write your cross term 
into a general entropy. So this is a generalized thermodynamics. The general thermodynamics, the driving force for the uh, flux, the heat flux, and any other flux, charge flux, is the entropy gradient there. Okay, And uh, for entropy, if you recall, is d dx1 over t and the q, right? So that's the, so it's t in the denominator. So, so any of this, if you write into generalized entropy as a driving force, then these cross coefficients are always equal. And this is the uh, fundamental, uh, say, Ansager relation. So here we have uh, Ansager relation. And in this case, because I'm not writing, uh, say, L21, uh, say, uh, dt dx in terms of entropy, if I use the entropy, say, they should equal, but uh, because I'm not using the entropy, so I have t L21 equals t times L12. OK, so any time, this is like I said, any couple of the process, you can always ask, where is your answer correlation? Next time you go to seminar, right, a guy talk about piezoelectric. Piezoelectric is the electrical and the pressure. There got to be that coupling coefficient from electrical to pressure to force, or from force to electrical. Their coefficients always obey the answer correlation. OK? And uh, uh, so that's the uh, form. And I'm not even going to write down those uh, expressions all in the book. And again, let's look at the, uh, uh, the implication, right? And uh, if I first look at the uh, uh, constant, uh, say, temperature case again, I flow current through the material, right? And this term drops out. This term drops out. But I can replace d phi dx by j kill, right? Then I have a relation between the heat current and the electric current. So if you do that relation, uh, if, uh, say you have uh, here, you have the heat current will be related to the electric current L21, L11, and JE, uh, JQ. Right? So this is the Peltier effect. So when you fly, flow a current through a conductor associated with the current, there is a heat carry by the charge. And this is reversible when you change the current direction. So this is the Peltier coefficient. Coefficient. And this is the, the effect itself. Is the, the effect itself is actually don't manifest just in a thin same, in same material. And what happens is that when you put the two material together, one and material two, and you pass a current, now at the junction you do your energy balance because, because the Peltier coefficient difference. So there is more heat flow out or more heat flow in at the junction because of this difference. So you have cooling or heating depends on the current direction, which is reversible as you change your current direction. OK? And of course, if you look at this, because our feedback effect is L12, L11, and L21 is TL12, so I know this pi, the Peltier coefficient, is actually related to feedback just times the absolute temperature. So these two are related to each other. And this was, a, uh, say, this is a called the Kelvin relation. But it's a one special example of the general Ansega relation I just said, right? Kelvin is much earlier than Ansega. 
Ansar got a lower price also for the Ansar relation he developed. Okay, and uh, uh, so we have the uh, example uh, of the uh, the Kelvin relation is an example of the Ansar, and uh, I think I mentioned this before. Kelvin is uh, say is a Lord Kelvin, and it's the same as a Thompson. Okay. Uh, I say he, if you check, he wrote over 500 papers in his lifetime in the 18s, 1800s. It's not easy, even to type it. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's the uh, uh, one case, and second case, if I just. Uh, Combine these two equations, I can always uh, eliminate the electrochemical potential d phi dx. d phi dx in terms express Q heat flux in terms of current flux. So what I have, if I eliminate the d phi dx, what I have in general, jq equals pi jq. So that's the Peltier. And then I have the next term is L11, L12, L22 minus L12, L21 divided by L11 and uh, times dt dx. Oh, uh, here in the front, dt dx. So what it, what it means? Normally, you would uh, probably tend to think L22 is your thermal conductivity, right? That's not the case because you can see when I flow a current through the material, the heat flow is one term is the Peltier heat flow, and second term is the temperature gradient driven. And so that this temperature gradient driven is not just uh, L22, is this all combined together? And so here, this term is the Ke is the electronic, because here I'm modeling electrons, right? I mean, the photons we already did before. Photon, we did the thermal conductivity expression. Electronic thermal conductivity is the Ke is this blob there. It's a combination of three coefficients. OK? And uh, so if you, uh, in metal, And you can uh, show that they say, OK, Ke, again, say all this roughly give you one third of C way square tau. And tau is the energy relaxation time. And uh, 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 you can look at all those and actually find the relation because eventually what's connecting them, if you look at their solution, F has a tau, right? F itself has a tau, has a V, has, let's say at the end you have density of states. So the difference between those different coefficients is just whether it's averaging the charge, it's averaging the energy. So because of that, this uh, Ke and uh, the thermal conductivity and the electrical uh, conductivity are actually related. If you recall in the last lecture, we mentioned for the gas, it's the same. Right, the viscosity and thermal conductivity are related. So all this is because you come from the pretty much the same equation, except that I'm doing different averaging. So what I have in this is Ke sigma t, and uh, in particular in metal, this one is a constant, and this is a pi square over a third, and uh, Kb over E square, and that is 2.45, 10 to the minus 8, uh, all watt uh, Kelvin uh, square. And this is the Lorentz number, and uh, Lorentz. And this is a called this is called the Whitman Friends law.
Wait a minute. So in metal, the electrical conductivity divided by electronic contribution to, to thermal conductivity divided by electric conductivity divide, normalized temperature because specific heat of electron is linear proportional to temperature. And that ratio gives you a constant. And if you check a lot of the material metal, in metal, the dominant heat carrier is electrons. And phonon contribute uh, probably less than 10% in general. And uh, you will see that uh, indeed the electrical, and this is very close to this ratio. OK. So a simple, lazy way, if you don't know the electric conduct thermal conductivity, which is harder to measure, is measure electric conductivity. It can give you an estimation, right? And uh, of course, so, so if you do semiconductor, that's a little bit different. And uh, semi if you do semiconductor, you have to uh, uh, go back to all this uh, expression. And it turns out that this Lorentz number depends on carrier concentration. Okay, because your EF is changing, right? Different doping will change the Fermi level, and hence, say, all those coefficient depends on Fermi level. So, but the range so far, this range so far has not changed much, and the theory I've seen is probably fact within factor of two difference. But say it's a fancy relation, but it's theoretically a possibility that I have is uh, how one can design a material so that the electronic thermal conductivity is zero, right? But the electric conductivity is not zero. And uh, uh, see, so the, if you if you go to check uh, when this is zero, and but you don't want the L one one zero, you actually say. Functionally, it's possible. Okay, so this is how you actually achieve this in real materials because that's very important uh, when you deal with uh, thermoelectrics. Okay, so uh, we have started from the distribution function, the deviation, and we say, okay, if you write all those coefficients, you should be able to show the fundamental. This is, uh, say, the uh, uh, coupled charge to electrical and temperature gradient, and the heat carried by the charge to the electrical chemical gradient and temperature gradient. Right? These are the uh, unsigned type of relations. And uh, uh, in many, many, say, in fact, those are, there are many very interesting coupled uh, process, uh, like I mentioned, uh, piezoelectric. Recently, uh, say they are also uh, I'm getting interested in this uh, so-called so spin. So electron spin can also carry heat, and the spin C back there that uh, uh, becomes a quite hot topic. If you're interested, you can check literature. And uh, magnetic, say uh, uh, say we talk about electron, we talk about phonon, and there are also the so-called uh, maglons, uh, the magnetic. Uh, uh, say collective motion of say waves of the magnetic uh, field. So all those uh, uh, say effects could be coupled, and this this coupling that probably can lead some very interesting technology or effects. And uh, so it's uh, uh, it's uh, worth looking. And if you do heat and mass transfer, again those are coupled, right? And in the heat and mass tra transfer, there is also fundamental relation between the heat transfer coefficient, the, the coupling coefficient. That's again an example manifestation of the general unsigned relation. OK. So I want to dip in uh, and get into more detail of thermoelectric. I look at the, my uh, our progress so far. I found that we're one lecture behind. So uh, what I'm doing is uh, trying to combine this into the thermoelectrics lecture. I have 30 minutes. OK. You already have the thermoelectric effect, so it should be not too difficult. And what I want to say, tell you, is where the ZT come from.
of the t, right? So given what you have learned, I can write the energy balance. And uh, if I, you can start with the differential, because uh, the equation I've given you are differential equations. So if I think about in general, when I have a conductor, right, I take a, a differential element. I have both heat and the charge flow in the material. This is the x, x plus dx. Right here, I have the uh, jq at the x. And uh, uh, here, I have a jq at the x plus dx. Right? And uh, when I look at the energy balance under an electric field, I also have the change in electrochemical potential. Right? So if I write my energy balance for this problem, so I have jq at the x minus jq at the x plus dx. That's the heat carried by charge. Flow in minus flow out. And I could have also, of course, uh, uh, you can think about that you can have convection or that radiation. I'm neglecting that. But uh, because I have electric field, I cannot neglect that. So my field is the current, how much energy those charges are losing is uh, how much electrochemical potential uh, gradient that I lost in this section. Right? So this I def uh, uh, define gives me zero. So that's my energy balance. And uh, uh, if I, sometimes uh, I also feel this is not necessary. I can just uh, write my, uh, here is my uh, heat equation, right? Heat carried by charge. But if I add uh, electrochemical energy by charge, Together, that's the total energy, energy flux. And that will give me the same e expressions. So this is, say, electrochemical heat. And if you uh, now substitute what we have here, right? Uh, eventually, I wrote down a different expression here. Oops. Did I erase it? OK, so the, the equation we, I just written down. So if this is a cross-section A, so what I'll have is after I put it in is dt uh, A times d dx. This is the heat term. The difference of these two gives me the tail times the car, electric current minus the electronic thermal conductivity dt dx. And in fact, I say uh, I should uh, erase this electronic. I should uh, just use the total thermal because I also have phonons, right? I have the lattice heat conduction. So I combine them all together, dt dx. And then dx, so this is the, in the difference uh, of the two over the section dx plus i d phi dx, d phi equals 0. But recall that I have to, when I look at the d phi dx, I have to look at the jq and dt dx term. Right? It's coupled. Right? When I have a d phi dx, I have to go back and replace d phi dx in terms of jq and dtdx. I have another term. Right? So now you put in all this together. I'm not going through the math. And what you have is a K. If I assume temperature, uh, say, thermal conductivity is temperature independent. That's the first term, dtdx, K okay, dtdx squared. That's a typical what I have in a heat conduction equation. But I have an extra term. That's what I want to show. This is J E, uh, J Q, T D S, D T, and D T D X. Plus, 
uh, j square over sigma equals zero. So this is the jar heating, right? Is a I square R. <coughs> this is the heat conduction, normal heat conduction. This term is reversible. There's an extra term when I pass a current through a thin material, and depends on the direction of this current the relative temperature gradient, I can have a, along the material heating and cooling. Okay? And this is the Thomson term. Thomson effect. So that's a law Kelvin. And he discovered, so Seebeck and Pelter were all experimentally discovered. And he tried to connect them. And he said there has to be a third effect. And he was honored for this Thomson effect. And this one is reversible when you pass current and uh, say uh, through the material. And in fact, I say the negative sign because we have here is more heat generation. This is a, a cooling uh, in the current, uh, uh, say, rotation there. So the uh, Thomson effect for this Thomson effect, we can also define Thomson coefficient. So thermoelectric effect, when we talk thermoelectric effects, there are actually three effects. So the Thompson coefficient is the cooling, the local cooling uh, divided by the JE, JQ, DT, DX. And this one is T, DS, DT. And this is the Thompson coefficient. So in fact, say all thermoelectric coefficient, Thomson coefficient, here Kelvin relation between Peltier and Seebeck coefficient, you see it's all related, right? And uh, uh, there was a very interesting guy in thermoelectrics, and it's a Russian, and uh, uh, he has a, a book on thermo very thermoelectric effects. It depends on how you arrange your magnetic field, Temperature gradient, current flow, there are probably over 100 effects. He has a toy table there. Okay, every time I go to thermoelectric conference, if we give a talk, you'll see that table. Some of this might be interesting. I really haven't looked into all those details. But uh, uh, so the point is, uh, see, those coupled transport, there are many variations. And uh, so now you can go ahead, go to solve. This is a differential equation, right? If you typically your Seebeck coefficient will be indeed temperature dependent, so you're going to go to solve it. And the most time, this coefficient, the Thomson effect, is actually is not very strong, so it's, you can approximately neglect it. So if you neglect it, now we go to look at the simple device analysis. Right, so the simplest uh, device is just a one leg. Normally, you do you never use one leg because you have to put the leads there. But when you think about analysis, let's say uh, if I do a cooling, right? If I pass a current through, and uh, uh, say the current, let's say this is a hose, positive charge. So the current flow in this direction, the whole flow this direction. They carry energy from this side to the other side. This side cools down, this side heats up. Right? So let's say this is a hot, this is a cold. That could, you could create a Peltier cooler. That's the current application of thermoelectrics, mostly is using you, uh, for cooling. And uh, um, so if I neglect the Thomson effect, you go to solve this equation based on the boundary condition TCTH, you can find the temperature gradient, temperature profile in the material. That's easy, right? Uniform heat generation, heat conduction. You took a heat, if you took a heat transfer course, you can solve it. 
But if not, but you can still solve this. It's a second order, very easy differential equation. OK, so uh, if you solve it, you will find out the heat conduction at the cold surface, right? You have conduction. And this conduction is uh, because uh, you establish by cooling, you establish a temperature greater than TH and TC. So you have a reverse heat flow due to heat conduction of the material. So this heat conduction is a Ka TH minus TC. And this is coming back. This is actually not what you want, right? And be, but also, there's another term because I have a jar heating term. So this jar heating, again, you, you can prove, exactly, say, mathematically, right? Jar heating is a uniform distributed lag. If you solve that equation, you find out one half go back, right? The other half goes the other direction. So what you have is a one half I squared. I is the current. R is the electric resistance. So electric resistance is 1 over sigma L over A. Right? L is the length. A is the cross section. So this is the conduction due to the established temperature difference reverse flow and due to the jar heat conduct back at this interface. So this is reverse heat flow back. And now if you make a cooler, your electrical current is flow this direction. They carry a heat away from this interface. So they let cooling, Q cooling, is the Peltier coefficient times current, which Peltier is Ts Thompson times current. And then counterbalanced by this reverse heat flow, which is the so let's say R, uh, say KTH, K, this is the conductance, right? KTH, TH minus TC, minus one half I square RE. So this is the lead cooling you have. What you really want is this term. But because the material has a finite thermal conductivity, you want a zero, that's good, right? So you have heat reverse back. You have jar heating in the material. So you also uh, uh, don't like that. You want the S is large. So, um, and the, but you look at this, the cooling, Peltier cooling is a linear proportional to current. Jar heating is I squared, so there is an optimum current. You can take that. You find the I optimum. Then you take the gradient equals zero, derivative equals zero. Then the I optimum is STC over RE. So that's the optimum uh, current for the cooling. And in this case, you have the maximum cooling. OK? The maximum cooling, uh, I'm not going to write it down. But the, when the maximum cooling is zero, you see why you do, you do that. When it's zero, you actually create the largest delta T. You don't cool anything, your maximum delta T you can have. Right? So the maximum delta T, I'm going to write it down. So when you have also uh, Q cool cooling equals zero, then you get your maximum T hot minus T cold maximum. And it turns out there's a, a quadratic equation. It's so one half Z T C square. And this Z is a famous Z T figure of merit of the material. Where Z including S square sigma over K. And this is the figure of merit. OK? So the unit of this is the inverse Kelvin. You go to check. And most of the time, it appears as a product of Z with the temperature. 
So ZT is a long dimensional. Oh, OK. This is cooling. But say, for cooling, I don't necessarily want, I want them, what's the most efficient, right? I also care about the efficiency of cooling. You know, I make a refrigerator, and that's a, uh, so you don't call efficiency when you make a refrigerator. You say, what do you pay electricity, and what do you gain in cooling? That's coefficient of performance. So COP of cooling is Q of cooling and how much you pay in your electric bill, the power, right? And uh, the cooling already have, so what I have here, this one you can say is a function of, uh, let, let me just, uh, I'm not going to copy it, but you can, you can put this one there. But uh, what's interesting is what's in this case, what's the electric power you have to put in, right? Normally, you would say I square R. But that's not the case for thermoelectrics. You will have an I square RE, OK? That's the resistance, internal resistance. But you also produce here a C-back voltage is STH minus TC, right? So if you think about that, I'm, I'm drawing is a positive C-back. So the C-back voltage is actually reversed because you have more, uh, say, uh, oh wait, OK. So you have more charge in this direction uh, than this direction. So you, you have. So you have the, uh, uh, what I want to say is what should be this. Sometimes I'm getting confused now. So the sign should be, because I'm only using one type of material, but if it's a, uh, it's a, basically I need to put in more power. They generate the C-back voltage resist my current flow. So it's a S T H minus T C times I. So this is additional voltage generated due to the current, uh, due to the temperature difference exists across the device. OK. So I'm paying more to overcome that temperature difference. So because of this, you can see when I'm optimizing COP, I have taken the derivative of this with respect to current. That's different than I take a derivative of Q with respect to current. I have a different optimum point for maximum efficiency versus maximum cooling power. Those are the operation of the device. OK, so you optimize this. What you find out, you, if you maximize, so this is like a, when you operate your solar cell, right? There's always an optimum point, because you don't want to run, uh, say, uh, say, a solar cell later on, you'll learn. This is the solar cell typically current voltage. And you want to say this is a, uh, your current. Uh, uh, this is a voltage. This is a current. And uh, you want to optimize so that the current times the voltage is the maximum. OK? So the, those kind of solid state, state device, there's always optimal loading. You match the external load to the internal load. And then when I do that, my optimum, uh, say, COP is TC, TH minus TC. This is a color factor. If you have color engine, that's what you get. And then uh, 1 plus ZTM minus TH over TC. And square root 1 plus ZTM minus 1. Oh, plus 1. OK, so this is a long idea factor here. ZTM. TM is the average of TH minus TC. So you can say, I always get a product of Z times T. That's where the ZT come from. OK, here is a color factor. Here is a long idea material factor. 
and you want to improve this material ZT, so increase those, right? And you will see this is probably about one fifth in many, given ZT equals one. That's a lot of material, current material. And that factor, non-ideal factor, is one fifth. So it depends, of course, that depends on how large is your TH mass. TC just can't reach certain, if your TH over TC is too large, it's negative, you don't make a refrigerator out of it. You have maximum delta T that you can achieve. <coughs> okay. And uh, you can also make a power generator. You reverse it. You make a power generator. And that's the, uh, um, again, if you make a power generator, you have a maximum Z, uh, Z efficiency. And uh, you need to no match it. So in the case of power generator, your maximum efficiency, if you do it, is uh, this is again color factor. If you operate the heat engine between a TC and TH. And the imperfection due to material is a 1 ZTM minus 1, 1 plus ZTM plus TC over TH. So this is a everything why in the thermoelectrics uh, people always say, what's your ZT? Because uh, you can't do much with the color factor. Of course, you can always uh, depend on heat source, temperature range, you can improve this one higher temperature, but it's the material also how much you can reach compared to Kalu. Okay, and a uh, few more comments. First, uh, if you do a thermoelectric material, even if you get your uh, best thermoelectric material at the hand, you may not know it, because, right, Thermoelectric material is a three parameter, and this three parameter ZT, right? If we look at ZT, electron in the uh, numerator, thermal conductivity is the electronic thermal conductivity plus phonon thermal conductivity. You have both, right? K is Ke plus K phonon. Okay, so we said that. In thermoelectrics, uh, this Fermi level can be controlled by doping, right? So it turns out the uh, electric conductivity C by, uh, coefficient all depends on doping. And if you dope the, say, very high, you get into metal, C back cancel each other. We commented before, right? C back in metal is very low. So C back drop as you increase your carrier concentration. On the other hand, the electric conductivity, if you look at the, it's the mobility times carrier concentration times charge. So electric conductivity will increase, right, sigma s. So you have to optimize s squared sigma you need to maximize, right? And in fact, uh, even this maximum point may not be the maximum because your Ke depends on carrier concentration, okay? So your Ke, Ke is normally small, but this is a Ke typical. Phonon, which is called independent of carrier concentration, carrier can scatter phonon. Once you get a lot, very high carrier concentration, Winman friends law will say it's proportional, sigma K, right? So that gives you a typical ZT curve. This is your ZT, and this is a, in material is about 10 to the 19. It could be 10 to the 17 to 10 to 21. This is the range. So that's what I say. This is a one over centimeter cubic. So even if you have the best material, may not know it because your dopant is not right. You see, this one doesn't work. So that's the difficulty with thermoelectric. You have to control, you have to search, you have you change one parameter, the other parameter change. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes uh, people, this is a contra 
properties, right? You say one way, the other way, the so how you can beat the, how you can fool the material, how you can fool nature to get a better materials. Second comment is this ZT, Z is the same, so like our analysis is temperature independent, but it's never temperature independent. It's always temperature dependent. So you go to look at your temperature dependence, right? This is temperature. And seabag typically increase with temperature. Why is that? So when I look at a semiconductor, I increase the temperature, the Fermi level moves to the center of the band. So EF actually goes to center. I'm changing the average energy of EF and uh, electron. So that energy difference becomes larger. Okay? And, but they only increase to a certain level, then start to drop. Why is that? That's because when I go to very high temperature, this is at the center, there are equal number of electron holes. The hole carry negative charge, they cancel the positive charge. So even though they contribute to electric conductivity both, because you have electron hole, the energy they carry is the opposite, and they cancel each other. So this is a bipolar. And the bipolar is really bad. Uh, OK, so what happens, the electrical is typically drop, and this, they may not get at the same point, same temperature, but those are different signs of bipolar. And also interesting is uh, the, uh, it's bad is because the thermal is also shooting up at the bipolar. That's because when bipolar hurry, the electron hole diffuse from one side to the other, they actually carry the band gap energy there. So they carry a lot of heat. So thermal conductivity is large, which all say, so the ZT will peak at a certain temperature. This is ZT will peak at a certain temperature. So for different application, you need to optimize and find the material for different temperature range. So those are the challenges when you do thermoelectrics. OK, I'll stop here. <laughs>